Good afternoon and welcome to Learn Some Series with me, Kim Bruce, proudly powered by leadershipbydesign.co, leading the charge with insights, information, and ultimately effective results. Joining me today is marketing and leadership segment, marketing communications expert, Craig Pagely. How are you doing, Craig? Kevin, I'm great. Thank you. Good to be chatting again. And yeah, looking forward to another insightful show ahead. How, how are you doing? All good. Yeah, it's uh, been a busy week. Uh, running around and getting things done. I was just saying now that uh, <laughs> I want to add as much value to, to my clients as possible to, to really help them shift the needle and make things uh, happen in that environment. So, Great. Um, so it's pretty exhausting, but uh, very rewarding at the end of the day, at least. Yeah. Yeah, you know, with with anything, when you, when you see that needle does move, and especially in the right direction, um, yeah, it it is very rewarding. Uh, sometimes it just does push one's boundaries a little bit more than expected. Um, but as long as good relationships lead to prospects and 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 great new opportunities, that's why you put the effort in. Absolutely, yeah. You know, it's and it's the old adage that you know. If you if you add more value and you keep adding value, um, that's the point. Um, you know, you know, because you may not see it at short term sort of insights, but you might see in long term. Uh, you know, you'll see that because uh, essentially the work that we're doing is is impacting a culture of yeah. an entire organization. So you know, it's how do we get that ship really sailing in the right direction? Uh, with consistency and effort and changed behavior and and, and um, but with that with the small tweaks and the consistency you you eventually start seeing the importance of it and and people really grasp it so it's really lovely it's, it takes time but it's beautiful yeah it is Craig so um what are we discussing today Kevin, yeah, I want to follow on from our health and wellness topic of last week, but this time looking specifically at a conversation topic that really is is high on the agenda in, in many, many organizations, and that is the, the impact of health and wellness on workplace performance. Um, and as you know, there's there's definitely a lot of talk, but there are a huge amount of articles as well. So there's some some interesting stuff that 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 I found that we're gonna discuss today. Fantastic. And um, uh, I mean, workplace performance, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, one of the things that we currently just worked on is a beautiful way of actually plotting, you know, um, how how well your team is doing and do you have a high performance team, right? So when you when you see when you in, include that in workplace performance, you kind of see you know, the things that we are measuring when we are looking at that is, uh, do people have the will to be there? And do people have the skill to be there? Mm. Uh, you, and if you look at those two areas, uh, you can quickly plot how, how well the workplace performance looks. But there are many factors that in, in impact it. So I think it's a nice uh, a nice conversation to have. Yeah, absolutely. And well, well-being definitely impacts on your will. Yeah. and on your ability there, there's there's no doubt about that so yeah before we cover the the you know one of the articles that i've that i've picked for the topic i just want to have a look at some of the definitions on what employee well-being is because it's quite a broad spectrum of definitions as well so referencing uh, hibob.com which is a company that develops online hr management platforms we note that employee well-being refers to a professional's holistic state of mental emotional and physical health interesting combination gallup researchers note that employee well-being includes five core components kevin and these are listed as firstly career well-being which is the satisfaction people feel with work responsibilities and how they spend their time at work every day social well-being which is engaging in health healthy meaningful relationships with friends and family Financial well-being, which is being able to manage personal finances successfully. Physical well-being, which is having health and energy for basic functioning of uh, um, uh, completing tasks. And then finally, community well-being, which is having a connection with others and feeling a sense of belonging in the place you live. And that's most definitely transferable into the place you work as well. Yeah, it's interesting, Craig, when you, when you, I mean, career well-being, everybody wants a great career, you know, physical well-being, everybody, you know, 
well, maybe not everybody, but a lot of people <laughs> want to think physically well. But when you when you hear stuff like you know social well being and financial well being, and even community well being, those are areas that are you know that are not often obvious. Right? Yes, and you know, there's the sentiment of you know. Um, I was watching a program the other day where people were commenting on being in the middle of New York and being the loneliest person in New York, right? And you kind of go, that's a very sad state of affairs when you feel like you're around so many people and you don't have the social well-being and you don't have that meaningful connection to people, how much, you know, how that can drain you and what negative impact that can have on you as a person and your well-being overall, right? So the social aspect of that can, and community well-being it is a is a huge factor, but I th don't think people always realize that. Yeah, Kevin, that's such a good point you make because you know I've I've been to New York a few times and and um, one particular time I spent seven days on my own in New York, just you know exploring the city, the architecture, the spaces, photographing, and and you do feel this this bigness of the city sort of bearing down over you and it could be quite easy to to feel lost and excluded in an incredibly busy uh, very singular kind of city so yeah you, you you can feel lost in it but jumping into into the first article that we're going to review um the article titled investing in employee wellness could ensure you have a more sustainable business in 2024. The article was published uh, as recently as the 6th of February this year and can be found on accountancy, sa.org.za's blog feature, Focus on Employee Wellbeing. And nice to see a, a South African oriented article, Kevin. So the article opens with the following paragraph. A, a recent study by University of Oxford in conjunction with Harvard University found that companies with a positive workplace culture are more likely than their competitors to experience subsequent sales growth, stronger earnings to asset ratios, greater profitability, higher marketing valuations, and more frequent earning surprises. And that's really a, a positive sentiment there. So as we enter the new year, the link between healthy, engaged workforce and a thriving bottom line has never been clearer. Unfortunately, businesses across the country still undervalue employee well-being and are incurring huge costs as a result. So take take note of the sobering uh, statistic here, Kevin. Employee absi, absi, absentism is said to cost the economy around 12 to 15 billion rand, with around 15% of the workforce being absent on any given day. So imagine that. 15% of the workforce across South Africa absent on any one day. Um, this definitely is a major area of concern for organizations in the country and something that's really going to take a lot of effort to control and, and, and course correct. And, and you know, one way to see this course correction is to obviously invest specifically in the likes of employee wellbeing programs, Kevin. Craig, I think that's, you know, part of the leadership, um, leader as coach program that we run uh, really touches on this point because very often, you know, absenteeism uh, comes with a, a bit of disregard and, and people kind of do it like, well, I just don't really, I don't really want to be there. I don't really care to be there. Right. And if you investigate further, you know, um, the absenteeism is usually a, a case of not feeling as great in that environment as you'd like to. But when you're looking at, at environments that are encompassed you know that that encompass really great well-being strategies uh, and also you know looking after career looking after social uh, and an environment that encourages you to to make more money and do well um you know absentee it, as absenteeism really in itself just starts declining in a big way yes so even the the attitude and the mood of an environment can impact absenteeism to that degree so you know i can i can understand why you know it, it can cost so much money because yep. on a on a regular basis when you when you have large workforces and the environment is not as great as it could be um you could be losing a lot of money absolutely kevin and, and the article 
really digs deep into the true value of well-being and and how addressing some of these principles can eliminate absenteeism or at least reduce it uh, substantially so so despite this increasing awareness of the importance of well-being in companies um it's it's often under valued in, in terms of the direct impact on the business and executives have, have in many instances tended to view well-being initiatives as perks um, mistakenly considering them separate from the core business strategy or at the very least categorizing them as nice to have um, and, and this is where the real value of the data comes to effect as Oxford University study notes that companies with high well-being ratings outperform the market, take notes, by 115.6% from 2009 to 2014, and by 57% between 2009 and 2019. So, you know, significant improvements in excess of, you know, 59 percent over the last 10 years i mean 57 percent over the last 10 years kevin um some some local research done by ulife which is a local tech driven financial services company um they found that organizations that are championing employee well-being experience roughly 181 percent return on investment with a key noticeable difference in take note reduced absenteeism and increased productivity um so much of the success is attributed to one simple fact the costs associated with burnout and turnover and decreased productivity far outweigh the initial investment required to establish some of these comprehensive well-being programs that, that are available for organizations. The article also notes that up to 25% of all employees in South Africa will experience depression or some mental health problems each year. And as you know from the work you, you're doing in the leadership and coaching space, this obviously affects performance and profitability, Kevin. And the highlight point here is that understanding and making provision for employee wellness and well-being is not just a moral obligation, but a sound business strategy as a happy workforce delivers increased performance. Absolutely. And and you know, I think depression is is a biggie because you know it's it's a silent killer kind of thing, right? And it, yeah, it yeah. impacts us, you know, people look completely yeah. normal. People look completely fine. People even walk around with a smile on their face and you can't really tell, right? So um, I think companies should be doing more to be able to investigate what that well-being aspect around mental wellness looks like because uh, it, it's something that it's it's not obvious yeah. um, very often. But I mean, Craig, the, while the statistics highlight the severity of the problem, what are the solutions uh, to improving the performance? So Kevin, there, there definitely are a number of ways to tackle the problem and the article notes in really five simple strategies that can be implemented to achieve this. Um, but before covering the five strategies, it's important to note that employees who feel supported and valued are more productive, they are more engaged and great, more creative and exhibit much higher levels of commitment to their roles within the organization. And that's really the place you want to be because that's part of that positive culture impact that you're talking about so so whilst research has been done to support these kinds of statements there's still a lot of conversation um questioning the effectiveness of of these statements so whether the topic is not just another work layer impacting on on so many facets of our lives these days it's, it really is a contentious topic in many organizations still um, that said, the, the Gallup study found that companies with engaged employees were 21% uh, more profitable than their competitors. Um, the same study notes that South African workplace exhibits some of the worst mental health outcomes in the world, Kevin. Um, but this can be turned around and, and this will definitely help make South African business environment where wellness is prioritized obviously on the back of employee assistance uh, programs but but it's it's quite alarming to note that we are seen as having some of the worst worst mental health wellness issues in the world of business kevin craig what's interesting is i've recently watched some social i mean i'm a TikToker, as you know and the, part of the woke nation that we have now you know you can't <laughs> you can't say any boo or ba or anything in the wrong direction because someone's going to record it somewhere. And part of this, uh, there was an actual interview or an actual uh, a morning meeting that was caught on camera from an employee, uh, but it was specifically white people speaking to black people. And 
typical racism kind of conversation that they were having and very racist kind of conversation. But they, the, the, the employees caught their managers and the owner, the owners of this company speaking really badly to them. And they were actually, they caught it on camera, right? Uh, and when you see it, it's, 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 it's demeaning and it's just horrible. Uh, these people were not properly trained. They didn't know what they, what they needed to do. Um, and, you know, to that degree. And, and I think what's important about that statement is, where, um, you know, when you, when you realize that people, you need to be more responsible, like factually. As an organization, if you're taking on people, you are responsible to those people to, at the very least, um, treat them humanely and treat them with some decency and respect. And that includes their well-being and how well they're doing and, uh, you know, make them feel like they're actually important to what it is you're wanting to try and achieve here. Yes. Say, you know, employees being valued uh, as, a, as a construct that you know, humans is part of your six human needs, right? Uh, if you if you're sig if you if you're not significant, you're making people feel insignificant. Yes. And if if you're feeling insignificant, you won't perform. You know. So there, there's fundamentals around how well-being can be tapped into, which a lot of organisations don't realise they can do quite easily. Um, and just just by doing simple things, by you know making them feel like they they belong. And Kevin, that's exactly it. Perfect segue into into the article because it highlights five really simple strategies that, when embedded into a company's culture from the top down, really can help deliver some positive rewards and see increased uh, performance. And these these are noted as follows. So the first strategy here is flexible work arrangements. Probably one of the hottest topics around. You know, a recent ebook published by Yula found that forty four percent of employees want more flexible working arrangements. And to state the obvious here, the COVID pandemic has obviously changed the way we work for good. And, and you know, one of the clearest changes here is that companies that offer flexible schedules, remote work options, shorter work weeks, et cetera, will definitely be positioned ahead of their competitors in this war for talent. The second strategy relates directly to these wellness programs. And in this instance, ULAS research found that 35% of employees um, want more and better mental health and wellness programs. So they're actually asking for these programs within the work environment and by introducing wellness programs that provide uh, assistance around physical, mental and emotional well-being, organizations can definitely boost employee health and create positive support for work environments. Again, something that's key for, for, for the, the, in the war for talent here, Kevin. The third strategy noted is, is that of professional development opportunities. And you and I talk a lot around this, where you know, we learn that in investing in employee skills and career growth creates a sense of purpose and accomplishment. And organizations that can create this culture of continuous learning by providing training programs, mentorship opportunities, and avenues for, for skills development, definitely will see a significant reduction in recruitment costs and evidence of more committed workforce. Craig, what's interesting, I, I just want to say, um, and still today, I don't know if you've noticed it in working in certain environments, but, you know, professional opportunities, um, when some, some, some industries and some companies, large corporation as well, they just don't have any kind of plan for succession planning. Yeah. But they don't, they don't have it in place. They don't, they, they don't, they don't communicate it effectively if they do. Um, so you know, it's it's a it's quite a big area that that organisers, especially in South Africa, because that's where we work predominantly. But essentially, it's it's a big uh, it's a big area of concern when you know you're in an environment, but you don't know how to get to where you want to go, um, and it kind of keeps people um, it keeps people not thriving. It keeps people not growing, right? And you, you it's a fundamental of of humans that they, you, we we want to be able to grow. Um, Absolutely, and, and it's, it's very much a key component of the work I'm busy with at the moment in the employer brand space, which, which you know, really organizations need to demonstrate that they have career growth uh, uh, planning well entrenched because that, that is a key need of any prospective employee, but also that they have it for the existing employee because the existing employee is also you know, part of the mouthpiece to the external audience to talk about 
you know, how good that organization is and why they need to come into it. So, so the employer brand, employee value proposition space, um, career growth really is one of the key benefit lines that, that has to come out in that conversation. But, you know, jumping back to, to, to the, the article, the fourth strategy uh, noted refers to the topic we often cover on the show, and that's one of, again, open communication channels. And, and the same U Life study found that most employees prefer to be in organizations with open communication channels, and this includes the likes of regular check-ins, the town hall meetings, um, and obviously the anonymous feedback mechanisms that help empower employees, empower employees to, to voice their concerns and, and share opinions to, to hopefully move the business in, in, in the right direction, Kevin. The, the fifth and final strategy noted from, from the article focuses on recognition and rewards, another hugely important component. And the requirement here is to acknowledge and appreciate employees for their work and achievements. And this can simply be done by implementing recognition programs, both formal and informal. And as we know, Kevin, such programs can go a long way to boosting morale and therefore creating a positive work environment and a positive workplace culture. The closing paragraph of the article notes that in 2024, companies that recognize the link between the healthy workforce and the thriving bottom line are definitely better positioned for sustained and competitive growth. And by embracing employee wellness strategies and fostering this culture of well-being, organizations can definitely create this ripple effect that uh, benefits uh, uh, are known to all of the staff and the overall success of the organization. And in reality, investing in your human capital is the best way to boost and bolster your bottom line, Kevin. Absolutely. So, I mean, the, these really are five uh, five simple strategies to implement, Greg. But um, with this in mind, what are some of the key benefits of having a wellness program? Yeah, a good, a good question, Kevin. And, and the article I came across in Indeed.com, really a good, good site for the HR world, covers this question in a lot of detail. And the article titled, uh, lists 10 benefits of a wellness program, and it's titled The 10 Benefits of Wellness Program in the Workplace. The article was published at the end of uh, 2023, August 2023, and was compiled by the Indeed editorial team. And the, the opening paragraph notes that if you're interested in improving the overall health and well-being of your workforce, then you may want to consider um, developing a company-wide wellness program. And in addition to establishing a culture focused on employee health, wellness programs also help increase productivity, boost morale, and importantly, increase teamwork. So let's take a look at the benefits of, of the activities associated with wellness programs, as mentioned in the article. The first benefit here is, is it relates to improving employee health behaviors. So behaviors being the, the key in, in this particular instance. So by improving the behaviors of a workforce, you can help team members lower their health risks and adopt healthy habits that will benefit all areas of their life, not just in the workforce. The second benefit is that, that improves employee health. So wellness programs encourage employees to eat healthier foods, exercise more, um, stop smoking, reducing the risk of long-term health problems, and helping staff feel more energized and happy throughout their work day. Wellness programs can also have a positive impact on your team's mental, mental health as well, Kevin. The third benefit here is it increases productivity, which all organizations are looking for. And research shows that employees who are healthier tend to be more productive in the workplace because they're more rested, they're more energized, and they're definitely a lot more motivated to complete their work to the best of their abilities. The fourth benefit talks about improving employee engagement, a really important point. So when companies create this culture focused on employee wellness, they are typically demonstrating and achieving a more engaged workforce and, and wellness activities help employees feel more connected to the company that they work for and also to their co-work their co-workers and these activities help strengthen the relationship employees have with one another and their managers and it definitely helps increase the likelihood that the employees will remain in the company for a longer period of time the fifth benefit is it improves morale. And you can see there's a nice build to these benefits because through the engagement and participation, you definitely get to being able to improve uh, uh, company morale. So wellness programs help employees feel more supported in their health and wellness goals, 
which can therefore help them feel more valued by the employer and wellness programs can therefore add variety into the workday and can be used to generate much more enthusiasm and boost morale across the workforce, Kevin. Well, I mean, it's, Craig, you know, the, 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 the fact that this conversation still happens in the world, is, it's always so funny to me because yes. when, you look at, when you look at staff morale, um, you know, it takes one person, one senior person in an environment to just take their ego out of the equation uh, and just sit down and have a conversation uh, and 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 you know make people significant. That's that's as easy as it can be to boost morale, right? But when you when you have active programs in place uh, on on purposefully helping people feel good and uh, having a, a well uh, a well being in that environment, right? Uh, it makes a massive difference, and it makes a ma it impacts the environment to such a degree. So yeah, when you when you when it, you re-emphasize re-emphasize it like this, I always think to myself it's like, why is it not happening well enough? Why is yes. it like standard fundamentals of the organization? And and it, you know, Kevin, exactly that. So yeah, I'll I'll go through the the, the final five and then just you know reread the, the the ten benefits, but the simplicity of them is just. When, when you get to understand how easy it is to implement these particular actions and activities, there's no reason why organizations should not be doing this and therefore improving the overall mental and psychological well-being of the workforce, Kevin. And, and as you say, take ego out the way and put the people first, you're definitely going to be in a winning, uh, winning situation. The sixth benefit here is about reducing stress levels. Um, so wellness programs can definitely help reduce or even eliminate prolonged strip stress that, that impact negatively on productivity. productivity. And uh, obviously this, this leads to unnecessary absenteeism from sicknesses that stress cause. Reducing stress in the workplace improves your team's performance and employee retention. Benefit seven, improving attendance. And again, you can see this perfect segue because when there's stress being eliminated, people's performance improves and, and there's an increase in retention, which means that you've got improved attendance, which is benefit seven. So when employees feel healthier and morale is good, they're more motivated to come to work and perform at their best, improving company-wide attention and attendance and therefore output and performance. Uh, benefit eight reduces healthcare costs. And a really important point to note this by improving the health of a company's workforce, employees are less likely to get sick or be injured on the job. And the result is a direct benefit and saving in terms of healthcare costs for both employees and the organization. Benefit nine improving teamwork may sound obvious, but when employees work well as part of a team, they're definitely more productive. And obviously, the quality of the work also improves. They tend to be more creative, really important point, um, since teamwork generally results in better collaboration and the development of more innovative ideas. And by participating in wellness programs together, particularly team-based activities, employees can strengthen their relationships with one another. They can encourage each other, and they can definitely hold one another accountable for their collective goals. And then Kevin, finally, benefit 10 is, is about attracting new talent. Um, so besides salaries, the prospective employees definitely are also interested in seeing what other benefits organizations are offering uh, to employees. And, and research is definitely showing that many prospective job candidates are actually looking to organizations that are including well-being programs on the lift list of benefits um, that are available and and i'm seeing that again talking around the, the employee brand employee value proposition work i'm busy with at the moment yeah what are the the health and wellness programs that are part of the the key benefits offered even to the point that that um one of the the clients we're working with is actually implementing and developing an entire wellness center for their staff kevin so you know simple yet straightforward benefits for for both companies and employees and the simplicity of them, improving health behaviors, improving health per se, increasing productivity, improving employee engagement, improving morale, 
reducing stress levels, improving attendance, reducing healthcare costs, improving team performance and teamwork, and attracting new talent. Yeah. And simple key benefits for any organization implementing a health and wellness program, Kevin. Craig, I love that, and I think you know it's such a it's as much as because uh, we've we've been touching it on uh, or on this conversation for three weeks now, and and you know just just reiterating the importance of wellness. But I, I came up with a quote, uh, the quote for today, <laughs> which uh, which is rather a deep one. Uh, but when you hear it from that, you know, from from who it comes, it makes so much sense. The secret of health and both for both mind and body is not a, to mourn the past, not to uh, to worry about the future, uh, or not to anticipate troubles, but to live in the very present moment wisely and earnestly. Uh, and Buddha shared that with us. Oh well, yeah. <laughs> and 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 I and I like the last line: to live in the present moment wisely. Yeah. Is, is 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 really a great connector um and you know add another word intentional in there as well yeah absolutely and then, and i think that's what some of these points are you know pointing out you know um, these 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 benefits that we are actually can experience uh, in a wellness uh, from a wellness perspective can be quite intentional Yes. So by by just living in the present moment wisely mm -hmm. and kind of going, okay, so what is the well-being of this environment look like? Uh, and suddenly things change. And, and and then again, it all goes back to to the Gallup research. Um, those five core components of of well-being, Kevin. Just you know, in closing, from our side on them again: career well-being, the social well-being, the financial well-being, the physical well-being. And the community well-being, and and really that that is something that you take with you into your workplace, but also take with you into your your personal life. And when you get that balance correct in in, in both places and spaces, you're definitely going to be somebody who's who's attained much of that enlightenment and and intentionality that we talk about. Absolutely, I love that. Craig, so uh, I don't know if we have guests joining us for this month. Or do we have anyone coming up? I, I haven't finalized any yet, but yes, we've got uh, two two weeks to go, and we always endeavor to get one guest in every single month of our shows. So, guys, uh, we might have one by the end of the month. <laughs> yes, I, 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 have, I have approached an individual. We just got to get the um, dates aligned, and it's a, it's a big conversation that comes out of all of this. Um, the war for talent and and what what do organizations need to be doing saying and thinking in positioning themselves effectively to attract and gain the right talent for the organization and and this entire sort of conversation around first physical well-being and and then mental well-being and now the wellness programs is, is a big build into the end point of what are they doing and how are they leveraging this in, in the bigger picture of the bigger conversation of the war for talent? Absolutely. It's going to be a fascinating conversation. Yeah, I mean, the war on talent is, uh, it's, it's, it's literally happening <laughs> in South Africa. Yes. <laughs> Guys, please remember to like and share and tune into the Lunch Time Series every week, uh, Wednesday and Thursday from me and Craig. Uh, have a fantastic week and Craig, I'll see you next week. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Look forward to that. Cheers for now.